Well, good morning. That was the best video illustration of sin I could give you. It looks tempting. It looks great. And the next thing you know, you're stuck to a lollipop or a ice cream, whatever. So I love this quote. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Let me ask you a question. You ever had a time in your life that you felt helpless? You couldn't fix something, couldn't change something. Maybe it has to do with a person. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's a situation that you're dealing with, and you just felt like, I, I can't really do anything about it. Years ago, I was the athletic director of a school, and uh, <clears throat> we had made it into the championship for basketball. At the same time, the day before, I was bit by a spider and had a bad reaction, so they put me on uh, a medicine. They, I told them I was allergic to penicillin, and they said, fine, we're going to give you Duracef instead. Most people, I should have listened more carefully, most people who have a reaction to penicillin don't have a reaction to Duracef. So later that day, as my skin began to crawl and my throat began to hurt, I called the doctor back, and they said, and I said, should I stop taking this medicine? They said, no, just take some Benadryl with it. Yeah, just so you know, that's bad advice, just so you know. So we uh, finished the, uh, the basketball game. I'm in Quincy's. Do you remember the big fat yeast roll? I worked at the Quincy's in Titusville years ago, yeah. So uh, actually one of the ladies I worked with 35 years ago goes here to church. I don't know if I should feel bad for her or good for her, but uh, anyway, so... Um, so I'm at the Quincy's, I'm talking to the athletic director, Boyd Wessinger, or the guy who ran basketball, Boyd Wessinger, and uh, we're talking. Now, I don't remember a lot after this. Some of what I'm telling you I've gotten from other people, just so you know. But suddenly he says, you don't look so good. The next thing I know, I'm on the floor of a restaurant. I, next time you're in a restaurant, just look down and think, would I really want to lay down there? When you're helpless, you don't care. And so I laid down there. Now, here's the thing. We were in a championship basketball game. So not only were all the students there, but all the parents were there. And I had a large circle around me. I just remember this blur of faces around me and the coach saying, give him room. And all of a sudden, the next thing I know, a paramedic shows up and his face is over my face. And he says, what is your name? Now, I felt fine until this point, to which I said, uh... Eric, uh, I could not think of my last name. You know, I have enough memory issues with oxygen, but you begin to deny me oxygen and suddenly I have more issues. Well, the next thing I know, I'm in a truck. They're giving me, I guess, epinephrine. I didn't really ask. They're just shooting me with stuff and throwing oxygen on me. And we're sitting in the parking lot. And so I said to the guy, I said, are we... I said, am I going anywhere? I was talking heaven. He says, no, no, we're going to sit here for a while and get you stable. I said, no, no, no. I mean, am I going anywhere? He goes, oh, oh, no, no, we got you. We got you good. And they took me to the hospital. They gave me who knows what, kept me there for a few hours. The principal came in. It was hilarious. The principal of the school came to see about me because he's thinking I've killed one of my teachers. He's playing with the oxygen mask and making balloons out of the gloves while I'm on the gurney. Just so you know, this is the, no wonder he hired me. That just makes a total, I've never put that together before. But here's the thing. I was totally helpless. I couldn't do anything for myself. Now imagine when I'm on the floor, the paramedic comes up and I say, I don't need your help. Actually, I probably would have said, I don't need your help. I'm fine. I just have a little reaction. I don't know what the problem is. I'll be fine. And then I would have said, hey, Jesus, what are you doing here? To which he would say, you dummy. I sent a paramedic to save you. And Now here's the thing. What we don't recognize many times is we are helpless from sin. And in Romans chapter 1, when Paul's writing the Romans, he first explains to them what our issue is. He talks to them about what the solution is. And what's funny is that if you read the end, and we're going to get to, and if you want to later, read chapter 1 into chapter 2. The end of chapter 1 into chapter 2, he basically says, you are helpless. And then... In chapter 3, we see what the solution is. So we're going to look at both sides of that today and, uh, and see the problem 
of sin today. Today we're going to talk about how your righteousness doesn't save you, how sin keeps us from knowing God's truth, and grace is our hope and justification. So number one, your righteousness doesn't save you. Paul picks up in verse 14, I am ob obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. Now, it's funny that he says this because Greeks typically thought they were smarter than everyone else. They're the ones with all the philosophers. You know, you've heard of Greek philosophy. So Greeks typically thought they were smarter. So I think it's funny that Paul says, um, I, I, I deal with Greeks and non-Greeks, smart people and dumb people. Okay, that's loose translation, but there it is. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Gosh, why is he not ashamed? Because you've got to realize, to Greeks, the gospel was weird. Paul is talking about this carpenter who came as God's son. The Greeks were like, that has, what? That's not, a, and then he talked about resurrection, which the Greeks didn't believe in. And so to, to them, it was foolishness. And he says, I'm not ashamed. Why? Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, time out, that word gospel, big word for, very easily, good news. Okay? So he's given us good news. By the way, we sometimes don't act like we have good news, just saying. All right? The gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by how hard I work. A righteousness that is by how many times I came to church this week? No, a righteousness by faith from first to last. I love that. In case you didn't get it, that it was everything. He said from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. These verses here are considered the heart of the gospel. Commentaries all the time say this is, this is the crux. Here's, the, here's it summarized. What is the good news? To them, it was totally foreign, this idea of resurrection. And yet Paul said, you are powerless. Now, you have to understand, coming to a Roman and saying that you're powerless was a big deal because Rome was very powerful. And Romans saw themselves as powerful people. And one of the things they felt like gave them power was their freedom to do whatever they want. And so if you've ever read about Rome, Rome and Roman culture made Las Vegas look like Disney World, which actually Disney World doesn't look like Disney World anymore, so I have to get a new illustration, right? And so, so Paul's coming to this culture who thinks we have all power, we have brought peace to so many cities, we are powerful people, we have the best armies in the world, and Paul says if you want real power... If you want to really be saved, not just from this world, but if you really want salvation for eternity, it's in the gospel, the good news. In Ephesians 2, it says this, All of us lived among them at one time. Talking about we lived, when we were not Christians, we just lived gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But... Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. And then he says, it is by grace you have been saved. So Paul said, in our former life, we followed our desires. Now, we live in a world today that not only tells you to follow, if you feel a certain way, you just need to do it. Now, they don't say that about weight, which I find funny. But they say it about everything else. If you feel a certain way, just do it, right? And so they tell you, if you do that, it will make you happy. And so we should not be surprised that the world celebrates sin. I think sometimes we're surprised, like, what are they doing celebrating sin? We're shocked by that. We shouldn't be. And the Bible actually tells us not to judge those outside the church. But the truth is this. The more we say, just do what you feel like doing. If that's the way you feel, just do it. The more we do that, you ready for this? You, you look up the statistics. The more we celebrate sin, the higher the suicide rate goes among young people. Did you hear me? So here's what's happening. They would say, well, it's because you're not affirming their sin. That's the reason suicide rates are high. Nay, nay. I would say because people are pursuing sin, they're getting sucked into the ice cream truck. 
and they think it looks good, and then they pursue it, pursue it, pursue it, and then, oh no. We all know an alcoholic. We all know somebody who started drinking and very quickly went downhill. And they get in AA and they have to say, I I messed up. I'm broken. The thing we all need to realize is that we're not righteous enough on our own. Your best day is not enough for God. You don't measure up. You can't rescue yourself. It would be like me saying to the paramedic, I don't need you. Because we need Jesus. Because of our sin, we all know. So let me give you something practical you can do. Because the truth is for all of us, listen, Christian or not, but if you're a believer over time, listen, you can become callous towards certain sins in your life. You've just done them so much that you don't even think about it anymore. And so I want to encourage you to allow, listen, every day, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. If you're a believer, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, lives in you. And you say, hey, God, would you convict me of any sin in my life? Would you show me anything? Don't just say, this is how I am. Don't just be Popeye, right? Popeye would say, I am what I am, right? But admit it. And now now here's the thing about sin too. The Holy Spirit has to reveal it to us. Why? We don't see it in ourselves. Do you know that grumpy neighbor or that grumpy person at work? And you know they're grumpy. Everybody knows they're grumpy. I bet you a nickel that person probably doesn't know they're grumpy. Or if they do, they just justify it. Well, I just had a whatever. And they say whatever they feel. Don't do that with your sin. Confess it. Admit it. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. So when you're unfaithful, the good news is he's faithful. You don't save yourself anyway. Number two, sin keeps us from knowing God's truth. I was, Chris and I were in a a, uh, uh, pet store one day. I think it was Petco. And they had on the screen the different facts about animals. And I looked up and they said, did you know that a rabbit cannot see something right in front of its face. If you put a carrot to a rabbit here, they will not see the carrot. You have to put it next to. And then I said to her, oh my goodness, that explains so much. She said, what? I said, men have rabbit vision. (laughs) How many times have you been in the refrigerator and you go, hey honey, where's the milk? She reaches in front of your face and hands you the milk, right? We're that way about sin. We think, oh, I see clearly, but sometimes we miss the sin that's right here, right in front of us. And we tend to do that with things. And and how does that happen? How How do we grow blind to our sin? Typically, you don't wake up one day as a crack addict. What happened? You took a small step. Oh, I'm going to try this. You took a small step. Well, I don't have a problem. I'm just going to try this. I'm just going to try this. That's how sin works. You start with just a a taste of sin. You just get a hold of that ice cream. The next thing you know, you're over here and you go, how did I get here? Step by step. Choice by choice. Listen to what Paul says here. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Now listen to this. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Time out. I really believe that one of the reasons people in cities often seem like they don't pursue God is not because they're smarter. I think, and this is a challenge to you, I think that we need to sometimes take walks in nature, go outside, uh, it's summer, drive outside with the air conditioning on, whatever, and look around and realize how awesome creation is. To recognize that we're not the center of it. See, too much of what we call self-esteem today is us trying to tell a kid, you came from nothing. 
You're just a, a blob of cells that just happened to come together and, and it was just kind of an accident and you just kind of happen to be here now, but have good self-esteem. What? When you recognize and go out in nature and you recognize that Jesus said, you see the birds, I love you more than them. And by the way, the older you get, the more you enjoy birds. It's really a strange thing. You get a bird feeder and you're excited in the morning. Oh, a bird. Yeah, they do that every day. Come on, Dad, what's your problem? No, 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 it's a red one. It was there yesterday, Dad. It's been there every day. You point every day to the bird feeder. Yeah, but it's so cool. Not to my kids. But the truth is, as you get in nature, what do you start to realize? The God who created the universe, you ready? Created you. And loves you. No wonder kids are having a hard time today. No wonder they're struggling today because the world is saying, do whatever you want and you don't matter. I mean, you matter. You're an individual, but you know, you're just kind of lucky to be here. But when you take a walk in nature and you recognize all that God has created and then you recognize how much he cares for you, it changes everything. And then he says, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images to look like mortal beings, birds, animals, and reptiles. Then Paul goes into all kinds of sin. For basically for the next uh, end of this chapter, into the next chapter, he goes into, you are messed up. And he tells you that when you look at other people's sin, it just demonstrates that you're messed up. You know what Christians are guilty of so often? Binocular faith. Binocular confession. You know what binocular confession is? Man, look at what they're doing. Can you believe what they're doing? Look at what they're doing over there. They may not even be believers. And we're judging them from the outside. And instead of binoculars, we need mirrors to look in our lives. We need to say, God, examine my heart. We need to be like David that says, purify my heart. You know what the big difference between David and, and uh, Saul is? They both blew it. Did you know that? They both did dumb things. When Saul blew it, you know what he said? It's their fault. When David blew it, he said, have mercy, God. I don't deserve your love. As a Christian, if you don't have any kind of guilt any kind of conviction when you sin. First John says, if you walk in darkness, how can you say you're in the light? And here's the difference between tripping and following sin. Pursuing sin versus stumbling. Everybody stumbles. Everybody falls. But if you pursue sin or pursue, pursue a sin lifestyle and say you're a Christian or you have friends that do that, it could be that they're not really a Christian. Read 1 John as it talks about that. Somebody in our church just a few months ago came to me and said, I want to become a Christian. I'm living in this lifestyle. Will I need to leave it? And I said, well, the Bible talks about sin and talks about the fact that when you want to follow God, you surrender everything to him. Do you think this is something God wants you to do? No. Then you have to surrender. That's between you and him. I'm not going to judge you for that. That's between you and him. You've got to surrender that to them. And they said, absolutely. And then they said these words, can I be baptized? To which I went. That was my best friend Sanford. That's all I could do. By the way, you just showed your age if you laughed. James 4, 7 says this, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he'll come near to you. And then here's something that really sounds like David's Psalm 51. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, double mind. And then he says this, Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. And then it says this, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Listen, if you want to taste how good God is, you sometimes have to taste how awful you are. You just have to recognize on my best day. I had somebody a few weeks ago tell me that they hated me, which was an interesting concept. And I'll never forget years ago talking to Rudy Moberg about somebody who was saying something bad about me. And Rudy said, yeah, but Eric, imagine if they really knew your worst thought. Oh, 
But what they said wasn't nearly that bad. If we're honest with ourselves, sometimes the thoughts that go through our heads, even the actions that happen, we're embarrassed by our own sin. And when we recognize the depth of sin in our lives, how we blow it and mess up, we run after the wrong things, we become selfish and self-centered, arrogant and prideful over the silliest things. I mean, don't you think you're the best driver, right? We, we tend to be prideful about things that don't matter, and yet humble yourselves, and he'll lift you up. You have to humble yourself, say, God, I, I, I blew it. Now, I can send you this list if you email me, but I'm going to give you a list that I each day go through, and here it is. Are all sins confessed? Holy Spirit, convict me if there's any sin in my heart, in my life, an attitude, an action, words that I shouldn't have said, things that I shouldn't have thought. Lord, convict me. Are relationships with others made right? Now, the Bible says, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Can I tell you that some people don't want to be at peace with you? They, they would show up at your house tomorrow and say, this is my house. And you'd say, no, 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 we, we have the deed. Oh, no, 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 this is my house. You can't please somebody that wants to take something that's not theirs. We all need boundaries. And so it's okay to have a good boundary around your life that says, hey, God has made me the steward of these things. By the way, if you're the pastor of a church, everybody wants you to have a truck so that you can help everyone move. One of the best advice I ever got from Harold Brantley years ago was, Eric, don't ever buy a truck. I still help everybody move, but that's another story. Right, Judy? Judy's helped me move some people. Are you seeking to glorify God above all things? Are you seeking to glorify God or you? Are you depending on the Holy Spirit's guidance? Holy Spirit, would you speak to my heart? Will you praise God no matter what? Now, I'll be honest, that last one for me is the hardest one. Because I like it when God does what I want him to do. You know, like, God, I'd like you to heal this person. And then they don't get healed. And I go, how dare you not do that? Well, I praise God no matter what. God, even in that, you're good. Even in that, you're good. Listen to this quote by Charles Spurgeon. If Christ had died for me, has died for me, ungodly as I am, without strength as I am, then I cannot live in sin any longer, but must arouse myself to love and serve him who has redeemed me. He came and got you. Number three, grace is our hope and justification. See, we tend to like to look at other people's sin, but we don't take time to look in the mirror at what, where we fall short. Did you know we all fall short? By the way, when you recognize how imperfect you are, one of the things you also recognize is that you can love other people who are messed up. You don't look at other people and go, well, I would never do that. You know what you start to say? But for the grace of God, I would be exactly where that person is. But for God's grace, I would be right there. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 3, 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. By the way, if you get a chance, read the rest of chapter 1 into chapter 2. And then when he gets here, he's coming out of this. Hey, you can't do it. You can't make it. You are messed up. <laughs> and then he says, but... Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned. Do I need a show of hands who has sinned? Anybody? Need, right? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Basically, fall short of God's perfection, God's righteous requirement. And all are justified, listen, freely by His grace, through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. We get a big word from this called propitiation, which is the idea that God has forgiven us even though we don't deserve it. He's taken our place. Even though we're broken and messed up and we recognize our sinfulness in 1 Peter, it says this, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, listen, listen, I love this, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Time out, listen. So that means you take time to confess your sin. You say, God, I know that without you, I am helpless. I surrender all, like the old song says. I surrender to you. But don't stay there. 
Because even that can become selfish and self-centered. When all you think about is your sin, your failures, your... You hear me? What do you focus on? The hope. Because of grace. Not because you deserve it, but because Jesus came and rescued you when you were helpless. As obedient children, don't conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, be holy. What does holy mean? Set apart. Be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. You ever been helpless? You ever messed up? There's a story told about Thomas Edison when he first started making light bulbs. And you've heard that he had to retry it a bunch of times. He didn't do so well in school either, by the way. He got in trouble a lot. He knew what grace was. So when they were doing the first light bulbs, it would take all day to make one light bulb. And so he had a kid working for him. And one day, they were making light bulbs. They made a light bulb. And he said, hey, take this upstairs and put it up in my shop. So the guy went to go up the shop. The kid got to the top stair. And guess what happened? Can you guess? Dropped the all-day worked-on light bulb. Shattered it. Next day, they had to make another light bulb. So they made another light bulb. Thomas Edison looked around, saw that kid and said, take it up the stairs. That's what grace is. You don't deserve it. You blow it. You mess up. You fail. You falter. But he forgives you. Not only does God forgive you, he gives you a second chance. Is there any sin in your life? Any area of your life today where you have said to God, no, I'm not going to give you that place? Maybe you're not a Christian, and the truth is, if you're not a Christian, you may not even be convicted of sin anymore. The truth is, you need a Savior, even though you don't know it. You're laying on the floor going, I don't need any help. But only Jesus can save us from our sins. If you want to be able to walk in hope and walk in joy, walk in grace with other people, Hey, let him come and restore you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'll be here after the service. After the service, you just come up and say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ today. Giving your life to Jesus means that you understand that Jesus died for your sins, rose again so that when you say, Jesus, I'm messed up, I'm broken, I'm sinful, I surrender my life to you, he takes your sin and gives you his righteousness. You don't deserve it. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian, but the truth is you've allowed things to come into your life. Maybe it's become normal for certain sins to just keep coming back. Hey, confess it. He's forgiving. And make it right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for these moments today. Thank you for your word, your power, your strength, your love for us. Lord, I thank you. That even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, you loved us in the middle of our worst sin. And you still love us. Father, today I pray if anyone's watching online or anyone's here today that doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender to you. Thank you for these moments together. In Jesus' name, amen.